Welcome to Bible study. All right, let us open in a word of prayer. Dear God, we thank you, we praise you for allowing us to be here and that we can have a wonderful time knowing you. And we pray as we part the word that we may just enjoy ourselves. Now in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So finally, I started to put this study together, spiritual gifts. I've been doing some reading from last year and I decided it was time to put it together and get everything going. But one of the things about doing spiritual gifts, I'm not going to do it as how all the other persons have taught it over the years, where they go straight into the New Testament and start showing you some stuff. Because I feel spiritual gifts has a longer position in the Bible that people say about it. So I'm going to take it from start to finish. So we're going to be on it probably about three weeks or something like that. Who knows, maybe a little bit longer. But I'm going through everything so we can get a full understanding of spiritual gifts in the Bible. So that's what we're up to tonight. So we're getting to the start. So spiritual gifts are a part of Christianity. And no matter what anybody says, it's a part of Christianity. We can't get rid of it. It's in the Bible. You know, some people are like, you know, are you sure you need to do this or you need to do that? We'll get into all of that, you know, whether or not if you do this or do that, if it makes you a better Christian or nothing. It, it doesn't really, but we'll show you from the Word of God. But the fact is, it's a part of Christianity. So even though some people want to say, no, it's not, and they try to shh, say it's not, it is a part. You can't get rid of it. The big problem with it, though, however, is that it is understood in different ways by the church. And when I say church, I mean <laughs> the local church in the world. Every church has different ways of how they view spiritual gifts. You know, I have a set over here that view it this way, a set over here that doesn't. And so the churches, if you want a debate, <laughs> just mention spiritual gifts and you'll have problems. Some people say spiritual gifts are reserved for the disciples and the apostles or anyone that lived in the time of Jesus. So they said, once you didn't live in the time of Jesus and you're not a disciple or an apostle or anything like that, then it's done away with. Nothing more like that, and that's how it goes. Some say spiritual gifts were never meant for ordinary persons, ordinary believers. So they said, no, it's still working today, but God picks a special person and only that person can get it. So that's how some people say it. So you have to be an extraordinary believer to have it, right? Uh, but what is evident, though, is that spiritual gifts are given to man by God. Now, of course, there are people who claim, no, they can give it to you. <laughs> but spiritual gifts is not like going to Walmart to buy something. You can't buy it and get it from these crazy pastors who tell you, I can't give you this and I can't give you that. It is evident throughout the Bible that anybody who got a spiritual gift got it from God. Hence the term spiritual gift. <laughs> you couldn't pick it up from man because man is human. Now, one of the first things I want to look at is some questions that I used to come across in my life, still coming across them, people asking me all these questions, people that I talked with when I was growing up, people who are not Christians, just a bunch of questions that came up. And one of them is spiritual gifts, if it's a new phenomenon. Right now I hear people saying, this is something new. And I'm like, spiritual gifts is something new. And they're like, yeah, when I was growing up, I never heard it in the Bible. So they're saying it's something new and they never heard about it. And I'm like, really? And I'm telling them, no, it's not new. Another question I, someone was saying, who gives spiritual gifts you know as I said if you follow some of the internet things you you can buy spiritual healing cloth on the internet for a certain amount of money and all that I remember this woman she gave all her last savings she was sick of cancer and she paid all her last savings to the pastor man Every day selling her a new piece of cloth. This will heal you, this will heal you, this will heal you. By the time she died, she was bankrupt. Never got healed, you know, because she was trying to buy spiritual gifts and all of that. So be careful. Another question I realized I came across a lot. 
does every church have spiritual gifts? You know, I've heard persons say, well, my church doesn't have spiritual gifts. And I say, well, it's because some people don't think certain things are spiritual gifts. But I find it hard for a church that has Christians with the Holy Spirit in it, and they don't have any gifts whatsoever. That sounds crazy, because the Holy Spirit dwells within us. So there must be something that, you know, a church does. Um, who can use spiritual gifts? Now, I've been in churches where, I said, the pastor or the deacons or the persons in charge are the only one that can use spiritual <coughs> gifts. The rest of the person have to be quiet. I've seen this. I'm not, like, making it up. I've seen persons tell other persons to be quiet and stuff like that. Don't talk out of turn. Who told you you could use that before? Yeah. So only certain people can use it. Again, not in the Bible. We'll look at these things to see some of them. Um, how do we get it, you know, in terms of asking God for it? Is it something we ask God for? Or is it something you just, here, you take it. I don't know. These are questions asked. What are spiritual? Some persons are like, what are they? I need to know A, B, C. E, e, you know, and what I found out is a lot of persons, and if you Google it, you'll see it for yourself. Persons, you Google what are spiritual gifts, they say, okay, there are seven spiritual gifts listed in the Bible. Then you look down the line, you see another one say, no, there's only seven. They see another one say, no, there's only four. They see another one say, there's only five. How come they're confused? Google not confused. What happened is there are spiritual gifts that the Bible mentioned all over. But for some persons, they say, well, this is the only set. We're not using these. Or that's the only set. We're not using that. So you find out the number varies because Google can't tell you what people put out there. It's just the information. So you have some persons that stick to only like Romans chapter um, 12. You have some persons that go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 because these chapters talk about different spiritual gifts. And so people want to tell you which one they feel are, but the Bible mentions them. So how are you going to say this one is and that one isn't? So that is one of the questions that people ask a lot. What are spiritual gifts? Some people ask how are the spiritual gifts used in the church and even outside the church? Because, I, I mean, when I, there's... Like, for instance, I remember this one pastor, he was never a big believer in spiritual gifts, and he felt people were like, yeah, yeah, spiritual gifts, and all of that. And, and so he's like, no, no. And so one day he went somewhere, and he was preaching. And when he was preaching, he was in a third world country, and he was preaching, and this man came up with his son with a club foot. The feet were turned in. And he came up to him and he says, he's been traveling from far. And he says, what do you want me to do? And he says, well, I'm not a believer. I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm not a believer. But I got a vision that I should come to you. And you're going to pray for my son and he's going to be healed. So I've come to see. <laughs> and the man is like, the pastor is like, me? <laughs> he wasn't, you know. And so the interpreter that was there was saying, Pray for the son. Pray for the guy. Pray for the little guy. He's like, okay, I'll pray for him. And he's like, you know, he's there and he puts his hand on him. But he says he's praying and he's praying and stuff. And, and he says here, the people start saying, you know, start chanting and start getting all excited. So he opens his eyes and he says he literally sees the foot. The feet of the guy start to come to the right position. The little baby boy. He said he was freaked out. <laughs> But by the time he finished praying, the little lad could stand up. And up to this day, he said he has never experienced something like that before. Again, spiritual gifts are given for different things. And sometimes people don't even believe God is going to use them. But you never know how God works. Um, what if my church is not operating in the gifts listed in the Bible? I've had people come to me and say, I don't see anything happening at my church. They're not using any of the spiritual gifts. What does that mean? Well, I'm going to leave the church because it's a dead church. <laughs> I've had people come to me and say stuff like this. So these are questions that I, you know, I'm like, calm down. There must be something going on in your church. Let's see. And sometimes people ask questions. What if I don't have a spiritual gift? Does that mean I'm not a Christian? 
And so this one comes up a lot. And I can tell you this, and we'll look at it a little bit later in the study. You know, if she has a gift and I don't have it, doesn't make me a better Christian than that person. Again, the word gift, so not everybody's going to have it. Because if I give a gift to my wife, I don't give to everybody's wife. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? It's a gift from God. So not everybody's going to have it. Doesn't mean you're a better Christian. Just means some persons have gotten married. <coughs> and you will see from the study that not because somebody got a gift means they're faithful. <laughs> you'll see that. Not because God has chosen that person means oh, they're the best Christian. No, you'll see that. And all these different questions I've either come across in my life since I've been in church or been around God's people or even non-believers. So even non-believers have asked me these questions. People who don't go to church, you don't want to ask a question. And so they ask you these questions and stuff like that. One of the worst things is when I went to play soccer when I was younger. I went to play soccer. I'm 14 years old and I get to the soccer field and I'm there to play soccer and somebody asks me a spiritual question. I'm like, and do I look like a pastor to you? <laughs> and they're like, but you've been going to church a long time. You should answer these questions. How does the spiritual gift work? I don't know. <laughs> that was my answer. I don't know. So all throughout my life, I've had these questions thrown at me. Right, And I bet many of you here have wondered why some churches seem more eccentric than others. <laughs> like for, we call them the holy rollers. <laughs> you know the holy, <coughs> excuse me, the holy rollers like, <laughs> they get all up. The first time I went to Maryland, <laughs> and I'm used to churches like that. I've been to a couple of churches like that, but <laughs> what happened that morning? I was sitting beside the wrong person. <laughs> So I sat beside someone and uh, I don't know, they were preaching and the spirit got to her and she went, wow! And I went, boo! <laughs> because I was, I was literally frightened. You know, and she came over with the arm and I was like, whoa! You know, and then she got up and went, nin, 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 and she was running around the church and I was like, okay. <laughs> but it doesn't mean because they do that that they are crazy. <laughs> Although we think they are, it's just that they are being they're, they have experienced a different side of Christianity. The spirit's working for us. Yes, they experience a different side of Christianity, and not everybody gets that. Not everybody uh, was given that side of Christianity, but it doesn't mean we all don't have the Holy Spirit. But trust me. If you're not used to it, you got to prepare yourself if you go there. <laughs> and so this is just funny thing. I, don't, I have to tell you this one story. There was this church about 10 miles in the country road where I used to live back in Jamaica. They used to tell me about it. And as kids, you know, used to ride up there because they told me the stories. And I'm like, I want to see. So what happened was at that church, they tell you, when you go to the church after a certain time, they come to you. You have the spirit. And uh, you like, huh? Well, you don't. Come and they drag you to the altar. <laughs> and then they set you down. And they're like, say Jesus. And you're like, Jesus. Faster. Jesus. Faster. Jesus. Faster. 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 Jesus. Jesus. And you see if you don't get it by a certain amount of time. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> they beat the spirit in you. <laughs> that is that I'm not making up. That's a true story. And every time I remember that as a kid, I'm like, I'm going that way because I ain't going to let them beat the crap out of me to say Jesus. So that was, that's what was happening when I was much younger at that church. Right? So this study, though, will answer many questions that people have had over the years or more likely expose you to other parts of the Christian faith. So don't worry. You'll just see new stuff that you weren't used to and all of that. At any point in time, during this study, please feel free to say, hold on, Pastor. So you're saying this or whatever? Stop me for an explanation or clarity on anything as we go along. So don't worry. All right. So the first question that I want to look at and I think should be answered is this. Is spiritual gifts a new phenomenon? Did it just come on the scene? Is it a new thing? Because you have persons out there saying, you know, 
wonder if this thing is new. Or did it start when Jesus walked the earth? And so you have a set of persons that say spiritual gifts came when the church started, when Pentecost came. I totally disagree. <laughs> because spiritual gifts were out there long before that. Spiritual gifts have been around since God started to use man in ways he wanted because of man's faithfulness towards him. So he started giving men spiritual gifts, women, whoever. He was giving them spiritual gifts. Now, other thing I want you to realize is this. God also just chose people and endowed them with special gifts from him. In other words, he didn't care if you were faithful or not. If he was going to use you, he just used you and gave the spiritual gift. If you found that there were persons who didn't even get a chance to be faithful yet and they were given spiritual gifts as a baby, they can't do nothing yet, so they never had a chance. And God just, bam, and gave them spiritual gifts. So that's what we find out right here. What is clear though is that God started operating this way through man from early in the Old Testament. Not like what people are saying that, no, this didn't happen till Jesus' time. Mm -mm. It was happening way from that time in the Old Testament. This means spiritual gifts are not new and started before Jesus walked the earth. Yeah, so it's old. So one of the things I've always tell persons, they try to disconnect the Old Testament and the New Testament. They're more connected than we think. Because it's the same God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament. He might have done things different, but it's the same God and it's connected. And when you watch it, you'll see today. Now, I know God talked with people like Noah <laughs> and told him things that would, not, that would have happened before it happened. So Noah can be considered a prophet. I have no problem with that if you want to say Noah is a prophet. Because he didn't know some stuff that nobody knew was coming. Because listen, think about it. Nobody saw rain before. Noah was telling him, water is going to drop from the sky. Uh, you were saying, what? Noah, water coming down from the sky? And we're going to be what? Flooded? They were used to water just coming up from the ground and the dew and all of that. They never experienced rain. And Noah told him that rain was coming. So everybody thought Noah was crazy. Rightly so. If I was living there too, I would think he was crazy too. Because <laughs> it didn't make any sense. So God talked to Noah. But, right, I don't want to use him as an example. As this was a direct dialogue with God. Right, through instructions to get his will accomplished. Noah, yes God, build the big boat. Put the board and the nails and this and this is the dimensions. And he's like, okay, got you. And he did it. So, I don't want to use that as an example because that is just direct talk. That is not like the spirit coming on somebody. So I'm not <laughs> using that as an example. And we all agree that God spoke directly to Noah. And even Moses. And Moses was a great leader. But we want to see God's spirit operating through someone. Because that's what we're looking for. We're looking for the spiritual gifts. Right? Hence the term spiritual gifts. So that's what we're looking for in the Old Testament. Right? We also agree that Moses did many miracles. But we again want the term spirit to be specifically said or used to confirm its use in the Old Testament. That's what we're looking for. So again, I won't use Moses. But listen, this, this does not mean the people mentioned above were not spirit-filled people. Right? They were all chosen people by God. But we're just looking for it to be said in the Old Testament, for it to be proven. So, when we do that, the first person said to be empowered by God's Spirit was Joshua. Joshua. And so, you know, everybody knows about Joshua, mighty <clears throat> Joshua. Now, to be clear, why Joshua is separated from Moses, Noah, and Abraham is this. Is that the other three men God spoke directly to in the initial phase of their journey with him, right? And so Joshua's was different. So he said, Abraham, you need to go for that land. Abraham said, Got you. 
Noah, build the boat. Okay, Moses, go with the rod. We hear you. He never said, Joshua, come. I'm making you the leader. That's not what he said. He never told Joshua that. The first three were outwardly affirmed through God's direct contact. While Joshua's seal of approval was within him from the Holy Spirit. Which at that time, not everyone had. Because the indwelling came on the day of Pentecost. And so, not everybody back in those days had the Holy Spirit or was Spirit-filled. They were doing law and doing incense and sacrifices. That's how it was back then. Thank God I don't live there. First sight of blood, I would have passed out. I'd have to call somebody to kill my bull. <laughs> it wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. that, that's the truth, you know. It wouldn't work for me, right? So we pick up here in Numbers. Where Moses is about to die, he's getting old and he needs a successor. And so he's like, I need to find a successor. So of course, Moses already talked to God. So he talked to him because that's what he does all the time. It says, then Moses spoke to the Lord saying, let the Lord God of the spirits. And if you notice there, talk about spirits of all flesh, flesh, come on S. They're talking about man of many natures. That's what he's talking about. A man that can think, a man that can do this, a wise man. So that's what Moses was saying. He says, the, the God of the spirits of all flesh, appoint a man over the congregation who will go out and come in before them and will lead them out and bring them in so that the congregation of the Lord will not be a, a sheep without a shepherd. This is what the Lord said to him. The Lord said to Moses, take Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the what? Spirit. You notice? Capital S. You check the Greek, and when you check the Greek, it shows you that it's not talking the same spirits as that. It's talking about the Spirit of God. So right here we have the Holy Spirit doing a part in the Old Testament. God already placed that in Joshua. There's no other way he could have gotten it. It's not like us back in our days now when we say, God, pour out your Spirit on us. You don't know nothing about that. God placed the spirit on him. So jo even Moses, who is the leader, did not know Joshua had the spirit. Because not everybody had it. So he says, take him. In him who is the spirit, lay your hand on him. And have him stand before Eleazar the priest. And before the whole congregation. And give him a commission in their sight. In other words, bring him to the people. Pray for him. He's going to be the new leader. And Moses was like, oh, okay, I guess I got discovered. <laughs> so we find here Joshua was given the, the Spirit of God. Just for clarity, in this study, I'm going to give you another instance which shows someone who got the gift from the Holy Spirit from God when they just started. Now, we go down further into the story in Judges, right? And what happened now... Moses had died a long time. Joshua led the people. Then Joshua died. So Joshua is dead. And after Joshua is dead, the Israelites get into their groove. <laughs> Start following everybody around the place and doing what they should not do. And this is what happened. And it says, And the Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they forgot the Lord their God, and served the Baals and Asherahs. All those are old gods and idols and stuff like that. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Cushan Rishan Taim. How did Mary pronounce that? <laughs> Seventh grade exam. Can you believe it? When I went to, went to high school and school the seventh grade exam, that I had to spell that word. <laughs> so I had to learn it. When you were back in the days, I don't think in his time, but back in the days when I was going to school, Bible knowledge was a class, was a subject, and you had no choice in the matter. One of those classes you couldn't choose. All the way from 7th to ninth grade, you had Bible study class, and you just had to go. And it was great because I went to Sunday school, so I always aced that class. Except when they come to the spellings. Because <laughs> the teacher would always be, and I never forgot that word from sin. So, yep, that's why I know that word. So, king of Mesopotamia, and the Israelites served him for eight years. They were under bondage. And so it was terrible for them. And so this is what happened. 
But when the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help, the Lord raised up a man to rescue the people of Israel. So you see, he was working behind the scenes. Othniel, the son of Canaan, Cabel's younger brother. Now, Cabel, that's when you go, you have Joshua. Joshua, had best friend at that time was Cable, and so he had a younger brother, right? So Cable was probably way old, and he had a younger brother who had a son whose name was Othniel. And listen what the Bible said happened. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. So again, it wasn't like he knew something different. God chose him, and he put the <coughs> Spirit of the Lord on him. That's the Holy Spirit. And he says that he judged Israel. Now, judging back in those days just doesn't mean you're right and you're wrong. He had to do administration. He had to um, talk to people that had problems. He had to plan war strategies. All of these things he had to do. So he needed wisdom. And it says he went out to war and the Lord gave him into the hand of that king. And it says um, when he went into the, the hand of the king of Mesopotamia into his hand and he prevailed over him and the land was at rest from oppression for 40 years so when the spirit of the Lord came on him he ruled the people for 40 years and there was rest everything was great but then he died and after that the cycle continued because there was nobody again with the spirit of the Lord on them and listen this continued for a long time it just it, if you read all of this like chapter going, it's just saying the same thing. And then the Lord raised up another point, put the spirit of it. Then he died. And then the Lord raised up another. <laughs> That's what he just kept so on where are saying. They at now? Eh? So where are they at now? One with the spirit or without? I have no clue. <laughs> I have no clue. But the Bible told you they would end up being disobedient, you know. What would happen? He told them from early. They didn't learn from their history. And they're being disobedient now till where he said they would lose the land. And now Israel has a little strip. And he had given them this. And they're fighting to keep the little strip. Yeah. So again, it's, it's their fault. And I know people might think the, what the name the people of Palestine are so terrible. But again, you have to think on it from their side. Israel came and God said, that's your land. If Israel had listened, Palestine would never be a problem because the Palestinians are the same ones that are called the Philistines in the Bible. Many people miss that. <laughs> and you know, the, they were warring from Bible days. So it's not going to change. If they had listened to God and wiped out, when God had said wiped out, they wouldn't have this problem. And now we are facing a lot of problems with the same Philistines. It's going over into other countries. Bible don't lie, man. <laughs> it keeps going. So, not all spiritual gifts, though, are listed or used in the Old Testament, are listed and used in the New Testament. That's something many people, because they want to tell you only these, as I said, are spiritual gifts. But it's abundantly clear that God gave spiritual gifts to those two men to do stuff. Because it says the Spirit of the Lord came on him. It must be a gift. None of them went, because when you look at it, none of them did like Solomon and said, give me wisdom. And God gave him that gift. They didn't ask. God just put it on them. So, even if you ask or if you don't ask, God will give you spiritual gifts. So, that is what happened here. So, some of them are not listed in the Old Testament, are not used, are listed in the New Testament. Another thing we realize that not all spiritual gifts are continuous throughout life. Some of them are short term. They're short term loan. You know, they give you three months to pay back the loan or whatever. Well, sometimes God gives some person some spiritual gifts and it's short term. You didn't have it for life. <laughs> I will see that, right? We also find out that some spiritual gifts in the Old Testament came with restrictions. In other words, God says, This is our contract. You keep this end of the bargain, and I will give you this. You mess with the contract, then I take back this. And so you're going to see some of that also here in the study, because we're looking at spiritual gifts right now from the Old Testament side. Not touching the New Testament, just Old Testament. So we're going to look at 
one of these persons now that had restrictions on their spiritual gift, right? And we are going to realize that no other recorded instance in the New Testament of someone else getting this particular spiritual gift. But again, it's a spiritual gift because how else could they get it if God didn't give it to them? And we'll see. And so we pick up in the book of Judges. And this is so funny. We see here this morning when I started to talk about this, we're going to talk about a baby being born. And just as I said, and the angel, somebody called and said, oh, they had the baby. <laughs> so Denise's niece had the baby just as I was saying this about the baby. So that's kind of funny. So what happened here, it says, And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Indeed, now you are barren and have born no children, but you shall conceive and shall bear a son. Listen to the restrictions. Now, therefore, please be careful not to drink any wine or any similar drink, not to eat anything unclean, for behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. So even after he comes out of the womb, he has to be a Nazarite. God made him a Nazarite before he was born. The child had no saying it. You know, I always thought, you know, why Samson was always kind of had a chip on his shoulder. Well, think about it. You born and your mother telling you, hey, you're the deliverer for the people. And what? Yeah, you're going to do all sorts of You're the deliverer. I'm like, I'm like, I'm a kid. But his mom must have been telling him stuff like that. So it says, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. So that's what happened. Now the story of Samuel picked up when he was a man. But they told us what was happening when he was a child. There are many persons missed that. It says... So the woman bore a son and called his name Samson. And look what it says. And the child what? Grew. And the Lord blessed him. And what? The spirit of the Lord began to move on him, upon him at Manade and Dan between Zora and Eshtal. What was happening was he got famous as a kid. Because he must have started doing some stuff. Probably he was there as a kid and the other kids playing and... You know, something went under the cart and he took up the cart. <laughs> and they're like, why did you just... Oh. Oh. <laughs> he did something, you know. And so he started to get famous when he was growing up. People started to see him and do see his strength and say, this is different. So what God did was make him look different from everybody else. Put the spirit of God on him. And plan to use him so eh, nobody can say, oh, this is just a, you know, fluke or something. They know that this guy is of God. Long hair coming down with the braids flat, never cut. He's not supposed to drink. He's not supposed You know what I say? Supposed to. <laughs> not supposed to, but we all know Samson. And this is the funny thing. He never got a chance to be faithful because he wasn't born yet. When he was born and he grew up, he wasn't faithful either. But still had the spirit of God. You can't deny it. Because Samson was our real life Superman. He could do things nobody else could do. So that's what happened there. Now, even though he was strong, he still didn't know how strong he was. And it says, now to his surprise, a, a young lion came roaring against him. Let me tell you this. Whether you strong or not <laughs> whether you lift up iron or whatever you see a lion coming you go running <laughs> mm -hmm. that's what so he was surprised and he was like okay this is a lion can't eat me he's not thinking about super strength he's thinking about get out of town but look what happened it says and the spirit of the lord came mightily upon him and he tore the lion apart as he would tore apart a young goat I don't know about you. I don't know how many of you have torn apart a goat. <laughs> I can't tear apart a goat either. But they're making it seem like he used to do this. So I don't know if this was a part of the show. Samson, we need to eat the goat. I got it, mom. Goat's dead. I don't know. <laughs> but they're saying he used to like he tore apart a young goat. And he says, though he had nothing in his hand, 
but he did not tell his father and his mother what he had done. So now he realized how strong the spirit of God is that even though the king of the beast have to back off because he actually tore one in two. So now he knows how powerful the spirit of God is. And you all know Samson never <laughs> was faithful. He kept on going the wrong way and stuff. And I mean, when you think of some of the things Samson did, Samson took off an entire gate out of the ground. The posts are in the ground and he rooted it up. And the gates of a place are usually something where men can stand on to see if anybody's coming into the city. And he took off the entire thing out of the ground, rooted, put it on his back and carried it up the top of a hill and left it up there. They had to go and get soldiers, now with horses and everything and all that, to bring it back to attach it. <laughs> that's why he was the real day Superman. So that's how the Spirit of God was upon him. What we learn though is that we've never seen this spiritual gift given again in the New Testament to anyone else. Never. Nobody else had that. I, mean, I wish I had it. <laughs> but nobody else got it. Right? So only Samson got that one. So he got restrictions. And that one, he's the only one that ever had it. So nobody else has had that one before. Let's now look at a short term spiritual gift. So we find here now um, Elijah and Ahab and they were praying for, you know, fire to come down from heaven. They just finished that. And now finally Ahab, um, he told Ahab, it's going to rain, it's going to rain and the drought is over. So we find here now Elijah telling Ahab that, yo, it's going to rain. So you know what? Get home, start riding that chariot before it gets running, giving you a head start. So you find out Right now where it picks up, Elijah says, go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. So he gives Ahab a running start with his horses. Then it says, now it happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and wind and there was a heavy rain. Right? So Ahab rode away, went to Jezreel. Jezreel is the city. And so he's trying to beat the rain down and he's ahead of the rain and yeah yeah with all his horses and his chariot meantime the real flash <laughs> this is elijah now then the hand of the lord came upon elijah and that's another way of saying the spirit of god came on him and he girded up his loins which means in simple terms that whatever he was wearing was loose <laughs> so he couldn't run with it because it would fall off so he Girl up, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's what it means. He girded up his loins because he had to hold it in place to run. And so when he girded up his loins, he ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Remember, Ahab had a start. So Ahab had a head start. He was in horses on a chariot, and the king's chariot must be the fastest. And so he's there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And out of the blue, What's up, man? <laughs> oh, everything good? I'll see you at the city. That must have been something Ahab could not understand for the rest of his life. He's like, what? And he reached the entrance of the city before Ahab, who is in a chariot. So this one is like a short-term one, where the Spirit of the Lord came on him, and he did something mighty. Nobody could explain it, but this is what happened. Has to be a spiritual gift. It's not every day Elijah running like that. <laughs> so that this is actually the fastest man on the planet. But he never got the Guinness Book of World Record like you say both. <laughs> but he's actually the fastest man. So here we see a short term happening where the Spirit of God came on somebody and they did something amazing. So we're realizing that spiritual gifts are being given all over in the Old Testament. Another thing we discover in the Old Testament is that some spiritual gifts that were given right then is still being given now. So now all of them that he gave then he held back. Some of them that he gave in the Old Testament, you're going to see pop up in the New Testament when we get to the New Testament study. Right? So 
first person we look at here is Samuel. And so, he came down here now. This time Samuel was still good. He's going to be the king of Israel. And basically they tell him he's going to be king. He's looking for his donkeys. And he's searching for his donkeys. You know, and um, um, Saul is his name. I saw um, Samuel is the prophet. So Samuel sees Saul walking up and down and says, What are you looking for? I'm looking for my donkeys. And Samuel was the prophet said, You're going to be the king. And so it's like, yeah, I'm going to be the king. Yeah, right. I'm going to find my donkeys. <laughs> he didn't want to get into that whole king thing. And then what happened after, you know, going through the ropes with Samuel the prophet, he went looking for his donkeys. He had not time to with this king thing. And this is what happened. When they came there to the hill, there was a group of prophets there to meet him. Now, prophets... Back in those days, you already know God only put his spirit on certain persons. So if you were a prophet, everybody know you had the spirit of God. Just like Samuel, he had the spirit of God. Right? So nobody could just come and say, I'm a prophet. You got to prove yourself if you're a prophet. So these were prophets of God. And it says, then the spirit of God came upon him. And look what happened. He prophesied among them. So the prophets were there, you know, at the hill, hallelujah, and doing all their crazy stuff, like what the Holy Roller's doing. <laughs> and he like passing, like, this is crazy. Next thing you know, it's like, hallelujah, <laughs> doing all of that too. And it was like, whoa, what's happening here? He was looking for his donkeys. And it happened when all who knew him formally saw that he indeed prophesied among the prophets, and all of them getting doing their stuff, you know. That the people said to one another, hey, what is that? What's come of the son of Kish? This is crazy. Is Saul also among the prophets? Everybody's like, did you see that? He was passing them and whap, he went in and started prophesying. This is crazy. And so... He never expected that the Spirit of God was going to come on him. And God didn't say, hey, I'm going to give it to you today. <laughs> he just passed in looking for his donkeys. And this is what happened to him. So now people are like, oh, he's a prophet. Never happened to him again after that for a long time. So he was like, you know, I'm good. I'm okay. I got over this. But one thing I've learned is this. Spiritual gifts are given by the Holy Spirit. And can be taken back by the Holy Spirit. Don't think God will not take it back from you. You're messing around with it and not doing what he will take it back from you. And we pick up, right, with Samuel later now when he's um, in Saul, later when he's king. So in the book of Samuel, Saul actually became King Saul and he was doing great. Then after he started doing bad. <laughs> Wanted to kill David and all of that. And things weren't doing well. And we continued disobeying God. So this is what the Holy Spirit did. It says, but the Spirit of the Lord departed from him. Departed from Saul. It says, okay, you don't understand that this is a gift. I'm going to show you. And the Holy Spirit took it back from him. And on top of that, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him and troubled him. Okay. People are like, what are you saying, Pastor? The bug. God sent an evil spirit to somebody? How is that possible? Now, there are two interpretations for this. One is that um, the Lord stepped back. No more protection for him. And now the devil and his minions can be in the king's ears and the fallen angels. And they're tormenting him. And he's like, oh, can't take this. The other interpretation is that the Holy Spirit now stood outside of him and was on his case. And see, I was inside you at one time and now I'm outside and I'm not going to stop tormenting you until you get things right. So those are the two interpretations. I prefer the latter because when I read further down in the, um, I mean, I prefer the first one. When I read further down, it says that evil spirit continued to trouble him. And his servants came to me and said, listen, I know a guy who the Spirit of God is. And when this guy come and play his harp, man, that spirit will leave you. You can't stay in the same place with him, which is who? David. And so when David came and played, that's when he had an ease and the spirits left. Now I'm thinking when David came and was playing and he had the Spirit of God in him, the evil spirit's like, 
We'll see you later, Saul. <laughs> we can't stay here when he's here. <laughs> so when he stops playing, then they come back and torment him. And that's what the Bible kept on saying happening to him. If he wanted peace, he had to have David in his presence playing. So I rather that one. That's the one I pick. But anyone is accepted that you want. But the fact of the matter is that the Lord took away the Holy Spirit from him and he had no more wisdom, no more power. He couldn't do anything wise. And listen, he went on doing so bad that he was the first one to go into witchcraft as a king. I can't remember another king that went into witchcraft that deep. He went into witchcraft that bad and brought up somebody from the dead. And even the witch was frightened because the witch wasn't really thinking she could bring somebody from the dead. She just practicing her witchcraft. And she brought up somebody from the dead because God allowed it. And it was um, Samuel. And Samuel was like, you real? What are you doing? Are you crazy? You're a king. Are you mentioned with witchcraft? I'll tell you what's going to happen. You're going to have a terrible death. And because of him doing stuff like that, his death was so terrible that they hacked him to pieces. Mm -hmm. Right? And when they hacked him to pieces, they put him on the enemy wall. Nailed it on piece by piece. Coo -coo, coo -toot -toot. So when people were passing the city gates, they saw a piece of him just hanging, piece of him here. That's what they did. And they wanted to bury their king, so they had to formulate a plan, sneak into the enemy camp, take down the pieces off the wall, then take it back to Israel just to bury him. That's all. Don't mess with God. <laughs> Don't mess with God. But that's what happened. Right? We see God now taking it away also from Samson. Because Samson broke the contract eventually. Now, I'm showing you how God is so gracious. Even though in those old days. Because Samson broke most of the contract. But God still kept it going because of the hair never did anything right and we read and pick up here and she made samson sleep on her knees he was sleeping with the enemy <laughs> and she called a man and caused him to shave off the seven braids of his head more seven long locks going down and then she began to torment samson you know check him in his sleep She's like, oh yeah he feels different now oh yeah i got this and his strength went from him and she said, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. Samson! And he woke out of his sleep and said, I will go out and I will have the time after I've done this before and I will shake myself free. <laughs> shake myself free, huh? For Samson did not know that the Lord had departed from him. He didn't even know the spirit was gone. He didn't even realize his hair was cut. And so, you all know what happened. They took his eyes out. And you, but to show you how God honored the contract with him, that the people so dumb, they have him working all this time, they should have a barber in there with him. Think about it. When he didn't have his eyes. So that as a strong of here came back on his head, they should go, snip. <laughs> but he didn't have anybody work, and his hair started to grow back. And so the contract started to come back in effect. And that's why he was able to have the Spirit of the Lord one more time to kill all his enemies. So, the Spirit of the Lord will depart if you break the contract. And the Spirit of the Lord will leave you if you're messing around. So, we see the Holy Spirit at that time giving gifts and taking it back and all of that stuff. Right? The Holy Spirit has the power to operate through anyone he chooses at any time without checking with man. Don't have to check with me. If you're going to use Rochelle to do well, you just use her. No, not according to the pastor. I say, you know, he has to check in with me first. I didn't know God had to check in with anybody. And he's our creator. So the Holy Spirit doesn't have to check in with anybody. And we're going to see that right now. We go back to Samuel again. And it's Saul again. He has the examples of all of these things. Now, this is what was happening. He now decided he's going to kill David. Remember the same guy that used to make him come first? He made him good friends and after already found out he was going to be a king, he's going to be what? I got a son. David's going to be a king? All right, I'll fix that. I'm going to kill him. So he now tries to kill David. David flees. 
And so he fled and escaped and went to Samuel. Samuel, the man of God. Nobody messes with the man of God. You already know that. You mess with the man of God, God going to rain fire and brimstone on you. You don't do that. Right? And so he went to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and stayed in Neoth. Now it was told to Saul, saying, Hey, take note. David, that you're looking for, he's in Neoth in Ramah. Oh, that's where he is. Thank you. Good looking out. I'll get to this. So, this is what Saul does. Then Saul sent messengers to take David. You all know that's a cover-up when it says messengers to take David. He said, soldiers. <laughs> But it's because he's going to the man of God. You can't go near like, we have come for the... You know, so sending messengers with spears and swords and shields and so to take David because he wants to kill him. And this is what happened. And when they saw the group of the prophets prophesying, so they saw all their prophets again, acting all crazy, hallelujah, praise the Lord, and doing all the stuff. And who was leading them? The man of God. And it said, and Samuel standing as the leader over them. So, all the craziness that you see at the other church was going on in Old Testament too. <laughs> so everybody looked at the prophets as, stay away from them. So this is what was happening. And it says he was standing over them. It says the Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul. Mm -hmm. They went there to get David. And when they got there... Sir, they started to. <laughs> They're like, what happened? Right? So they also prophesied. And when Saul was told, you think he learned? He did not learn. He sent other messengers. Same thing happened. They prophesied likewise. You would think Saul learned the second time. Saul sent messengers again the third time. And they prophesied also. No, that would be a clear indication leave this alone, right? Oh, no. He decided to go himself because he was thinking, mm -hmm. God already took the spirit from me, so this can't affect me. That's what he's thinking. Spirit is gone. I'll go do this myself. So then he also went to Rama and came to the great well at Shiko. And this is what happened. So he asked and said, where are Samuel and David? And someone said, indeed, they're at Neoth in Rama. Okay, so he went there to Neoth in Rama, all big and bold, ready to capture David. Then the Spirit of God was upon him also. <laughs> in other words, God says, not because I took it from you means you can come and tell me what to do. I will give it back to you. But what God did was gave him an overdose. You ever see when they inject it in their vein and they go overdose? God OD'd him on the Spirit. And look what happened. It made a fool of the king. Now look what happened. It said, Then the Spirit of God was upon him also, and he went on and prophesied until he came to Neoth Rama. And he also stripped. So before he reached, he was prophesying. <laughs> That's how God jacked him up. And also stripped off his clothes naked. To see the king naked is a shame back in those days and he stripped off his own clothes couldn't control himself and prophesied before Samuel in like manner and lay down naked now one of the things that was funny here he came to get Samuel and David you're defying the king man of God I told you to send David you didn't send him well I'm here to get he's now in front of the man of God going take ah, off his clothes ah. the man of God is like uh -huh. yep you need to understand who is God he couldn't touch the man of God and he was in front of him and doing all the thing. He didn't even stop. So he went down, lay down naked all that day and all that night. People passed and seeing this stuff. That's embarrassing. Therefore, they say, is Saul among the prophets again? I thought we went through this already when he was younger. <laughs> so God basically showed him, I will give it back to you and I'm going to give it to you in an overdose and make up fool of yourself. He had to go home now with his tail between his legs. <laughs> yep, that's what he went home like with his tail between his legs. So you be, you got to be careful. The Holy Spirit will take and the Holy Spirit will give. You can't tell them how to manage the spiritual gifts. So what have we learned now in the Old Testament? 
with spiritual gifts. This is what we have learned so far. We have learned that the Holy Spirit of the Trinity, the triune God, is the one who gives spiritual gifts. Because we see God the Father, He talked to Noah, He talked to Abraham. But when the Holy Spirit is doing its work, it comes and dwells inside the people. It comes on them. So he's the one giving the gifts. Right? We also learn that spiritual gifts operate from inside out. Not the reverse. Right? The Spirit of God is inside the host at a particular time to accomplish God's will. While the other one, when God was talking directly to the person, he's like, I'll give you the tools. You just go and drop the rod, it'll turn into a serpent. You see what I'm saying? The Holy Spirit was now inside persons and allowing them to do stuff that they didn't think they could do. We also learn that everyone had gotten spiritual gifts from God. Some of the wonderful men of God that we talked about, nobody told us that, you know, Moses was acting all crazy like the prophets. <laughs> Nobody told us that, you know, Abraham was acting all crazy or anything like that. So not everyone had gotten spiritual gifts, but they're still men of God. So the questions even answered already with some of the questions that I had in the, in the talk. And this is just Old Testament. So when people say spiritual gifts are not in the Old Testament, I challenge them with stuff like this. Right? The Holy Spirit has the power to give spiritual gifts and then take them away. Still the same? No. <laughs> it hasn't changed. The Holy Spirit will give it to you and if you're messing around, it will take it back. And don't worry, we'll get with stories about that that has happened to me several times and got me into trouble. <laughs> the Holy Spirit will use whichever host at whatever time without man's permission. When I was younger, one of the questions asked to me, you know, by some of these youngsters again playing soccer, can God use a dirty vessel? Oh no, <laughs> that's what I said again. I don't know. I didn't know all of this. And so, when I grew up a little bit more, and someone asked me that question, me with my educated self, no, you cannot use a dirty vessel. God has to make sure the vessel is clean before he enters it. And uh, gave them a long information. That's a bunch of crap. Because you saw, <laughs> you saw um, Saul. He wasn't clean. He was going there to get somebody to murder. He had sin in his life and God went in and said, I'm going to take down this temple right in front of you. So God will use whatever he wants to accomplish any mission. Whether the vessel is dirty, whether the vessel is clean, whether they're a Christian or not a Christian. He will do that. Because he's God. You don't have to check in with anybody. That's just how he works. People don't like me saying that, but disprove the theory. I will disprove the facts because it ain't a theory. <laughs> Some spiritual gifts come with restrictions. We see Samson broke the contract, God took it back. Contract came back, God gave it back to him. You know, if Samson was smart, he would have waited, but then he didn't have any eyes yet. Yeah. So that's why he went. <laughs> we also learned that some spiritual gifts are temporary. In other words, God made you do something now. It doesn't mean he's going to let you do it every day. <laughs> So today you run and leave the car in Myerstown and everybody's like, wow, wow, do it again. And you call the TV cameras and everything and you're there and you're like, wait a minute, give me another shot at it. <laughs> you don't know what happened because at that time God will give you a temporary spiritual gift. Right? So you don't have it for the rest of your life. Some spiritual gifts are ongoing that follows you all throughout your life. Just like, like Samuel, the man of God, he was a prophet. He could see things happening in the future and he would tell them. Ezekiel prophesied things all the way until his death. Um, Isaiah prophesied things <coughs> over 700 years before it happened. <laughs> That's crazy. Even now the scholars are still trying to say there's only two explanations. Either they lied and somebody else helped him to write the book of Isaiah or he had some divine help. These are not Christians, these are just scholars. But they said there's only two ways to, look, to solve his book. Because he prophesied things hundreds of years before it happened. You know, when you think of him calling Cyrus, King Cyrus by name, and before, like 450 years before he was born, and says, Cyrus, you do not know me, but I am the Lord your God. He was speaking on behalf of God. And he says, you shall send my people home and all of that. 
450 years later, I'm like, yeah, remember when the crazy man wrote this in the Bible? And then 450 years they're in captivity, and all of a sudden, a king named Cyrus, he was in charge at that time. He just calls the leaders of the children of Israel and said, hey, you want to go home? And everybody's like, yeah. He says, go home, rebuild your temple, rebuild your wall, everything. If you need stuff, you can get it from me. <laughs> in the Bible. And they still can't figure that out because how could somebody tell him what was coming if he didn't know? 450 years, he called him by name. That's crazy. So some spiritual gifts are ongoing. And we find out, finally, that some gifts, uh, sp sorry, spiritual gifts are not a new phenomenon as we can see it imprinted throughout the Old Testament. So when people want to say, it's a new thing, you know, this is the new phase of Christianity. I'm like, this has been around for ages, buddy. It's not new. So spiritual gifts are not a new thing. It was in the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament. And as I always say, if you see something in the Old Testament, and then you see it in the New Testament, pay attention. It's important. <laughs> and that's Bible study for today. Any questions?